Assalamualaikum. My name is Dr. Ambar Shwak. I'm the assistant consultant microbiologist here at MASH. Today I'm going to be talk to discussing two topics with you. The first topic is automated blood culture. So let's begin. There are two main types of blood cultures that we're performing here at Mohtar Sheikh. The first is the manual or conventional method, which we had been doing previously. It involves incubating the blood culture bottles for up to a total of seven days and performing blind subcultures every 48 hours to observe for any growth. So what I mean by subcultures is that we remove the bottle after 48 hours without knowing whether it's positive or negative. We remove a few drops from each bottle and apply it onto our solidified agar or media that we have in the lab and we place it again into the incubator. And the next day we observe for growth. So we have no way of knowing other than maybe some physical aspects whether this bottle will uh, yield growth of a positive bacterium or not. So this, is, uh, this was manual blood culture and conventional blood culture. The next is automated blood culture, which we have recently acquired. This can be conducted on a number of machines like BactiAlert, BacTech, or VersaTrek. This incubates the blood culture bottles for us, and it performs continuous monitoring every 10 minutes for detection of microbial growth, and it will alert the staff when to remove the bottle and perform a subculture. So this is the BactiAlert 3D system that we have acquired. And the principle is based on an advanced colorimetric method for detection of carbon dioxide. All bacteria, after they have uh, used the media, they uh, produce carbon dioxide as a product of their metabolism. This is detected by a sensor at the bottom of the blood culture bottle, which changes color, and that is detected by the machine. Once the machine detects it, it alerts the staff with visual and audio, uh, visual aids and audio alerts to remove the bottle now for subculture. So this is the, how the machine looks. You can see there is a screen, which is a touch screen and display, and bottom has two drawers. This is what happens when you open the drawer. It has around 60 cells or chambers in which you place the blood culture bottle. Because there are two drawers, we have the ability to perform 120 blood cultures at the same time. Okay. This is what, I don't know if you can see the pointer. Yeah, this is how it should look, the negative blood culture bottles. The two ones that we have purchased, the green one is for adults, and the yellow one is for the pediatric bottle. So this is the bottom of the negative, of the negative blood culture bottle, which should be a dark gray. However, once carbon dioxide is present in the uh, blood culture bottle because of bacterial growth, it turns yellow. That change in color is detected by the photodiodes or the LED within the machine, and it alerts the staff that remove the bottle now, and you can subculture, and it will lead you a positive growth. There are several advantages that this will offer over manual subculture, and this is great news for clinicians for several reasons. Number one, it is less time consuming. So the number one concern was that there is a delay in reporting. With this way, it will be a shorter turnaround time, and you will, inshallah, get your report sooner as compared to conventional method. Also, if you have administered an antibiotic prior to taking, collecting the blood sample for blood culture, the media has some adsorbent beads that can uh, neutralize the antibiotics in the blood, and they will encourage the growth of the bacterium and still give you a positive yield. It has a higher sensitivity for organis organism recovery, around 60%, as compared to conventional blood, uh, blood culture, and it improves accuracy. Also, if you send a paired blood culture sample, whether they are from two peripheral sites, there will be an easy comparison because they will both be subculture at the same time, uh, they will be sent into the machine and culture at the same time. So you can easily compare if this is a true pathogen causing bacteremia or this is a contaminant. At the same time, if you send me one peripheral blood culture and one drawn from a central line, I will be able to tell you if this is actually a true representation of a central line associated bloodstream infection or not. So this is great news for you. Also, this is great news for the lab staff because it reduces hands-on time, there will be fewer chances of any user errors, and because the machine itself is an incubator, it frees up a lot of space in our shared incubator, there's less chances of cross-contamination with other cultures like urine or routine. And because these are unbreakable plastic bottles, it reduces chances of any accidents, spills, and contamination. There's also less wastage of media, because we don't have to perform blind subcultures every 48 hours. Now we, have, we will only do it once the machine alerts us that this bottle needs to be subcultured. And it can also easily integrate into the LIS system. Okay, this is a screen grab from the uh, website, from the manufacturer, this, uh, the website, the brochure that it provided. So if you look at the arrow next to the two bottles that we purchased, the green bottle, it recommends a specimen volume of up to 10 ml. 
and for pediatric bottle up to 4 ml. So this is the burning question for most of you, the email I shared, which was showing you that the volume that we are requiring is 10 ml for adults and 4 ml for pediatrics. This is not coming from me, it's coming from the manufacturer. But it says up to 10 ml and up to 4 ml. And there is a worldwide, uh, this is an international standardized uh, uh, volume requirement. Also, this is, I know this is a, not a point of concern for all the clinicians because this seems too large a volume to collect. And this is a point that uh, globally clinicians have a problem with compliance with. So we have done some research on this and what would be the minimum acceptable blood volume? Because it's key for positivity rate. There are two main factors that will affect the positivity rate in a blood culture. First is the concentration of the bacteria within that sample. The bacteremic load or the bacterial, the bacteremic level. Okay, so that's one factor. The other factor is the blood volume that you send me. Okay, so lower blood volumes can also yield positive results. It's not that I'm saying that if you send me a low volume, it will not have a positive result. However, it will affect reporting time. You have to then curtail your expectations if you're sending a lower blood volume, it will take a longer time to be reported as positive or to be detected by the machine because the bacteria has to reach a certain threshold for it to be detected. Okay, so there was a retrospective study which was conducted in Taiwan. This was uh, published in a journal of medicine in Baltimore. They conducted a study on adult blood culture bottles with various uh, blood volumes and they grouped it into those that were three or less than three ml or uh, seven to eight, uh, seven to ten ml or in between. And what they observed was the group with blood volumes of three or less than three ml showed the lowest positivity rate, whereas the group with eight to ten ml volume had greatest yield. Adequate blood volume sampling is crucial for positivity rate with a two to four percent increase in positivity for each additional milliliter of blood. So based on of that, we have decided on a minimum acceptable blood culture volume here at MASH. So for adults, 4 ml is the minimum acceptable. There can be exceptions can be made if the clinician tells us that there is a certain uh, special criteria that are not being met by the patient and we are unable to collect more than this. And in children, 2 ml is the criteria. And yes, we are able to detect the volume that you send us by based on the formula that we found, which is by weighing the bottle and applying this formula, we are able to tell how much volume you're sending, so we are able to reject the bottle. This was the workflow chart that I already shared with all of you in the email. We can go through it again. Uh, once the blood culture bottle is received, it's incubated, and within 24 hours, after 24 hours, you should be able to get your initial report. If it's positive, if it's flagged positive, even before 24 hours, you will get a report within 24 hours, less than 24 hours. Uh, I will gram stain it and send you out an initial report, but my job is not done. The same day, I have to now subculture it onto my agar, onto my media, and now I require an additional 24 hours for the next day to observe that growth, right? Once that growth is observed on day two, 48 hours, I will now require an additional 24 hours to conduct biochemical tests on it for identification and to perform any diagnostic disk testing or sensitivity testing. So three days, it will be of maximum days if it was flagged positive in 24 hours, right? Three days for final report. If, however, it was negative, the initial report will reach you after 24 hours that it has not yielded growth of any microorganism and the bottle will continue to be incubated within the machine. For instance, if after two days it does not flag as positive, it will continue being incubated. Three days it flags as positive, I will once again remove it, gram stain it and process it again, I will still require two additional days. If you send a very low volume with low bacteremic count, what can happen is, what if the bottle flags positive on day four? Day four it flags positive, I still require two more days. So you will not be getting the final report on day five if, if I had been negative, you will get it on day six. If it's a very low volume with low bacteria, bacteria count and it flags positive on the fifth day, I'm still going to require two more days. So your final report is even more delayed than had, it, had you sent me an appropriate volume or had it been negative. So this is how you can facilitate me and I can facilitate you, right? The other major uh, problem that arises with blood cultures is contamination. And uh, this can really compromise your quality of care 
and lead to unnecessary antibiotic exposure. It can prolong the length of hospitalization. And virtually all blood culture contamination occurs at the time of collection. So there are frequent causes which, ha uh, which uh, lead to this is poor collection technique or insufficient skin disinfection. And those frequently encountered contaminants are usually coagulus negative staphylococci, crinibacterium, bacillus subtilis, microfocus species, which is an environmental contaminant, and QT bacterium, mostly normal skin flora. The consequences of uh, contamination include unnecessary antibiotic exposure with the potential for downstream unintended consequences. For example, there could be a possible allergy to a certain antibiotic or excessive use of second generation cephalosporins could lead to C. diff infection in the future. Other possible consequences can include the unnecessary removal of a device or a catheter where it was not required and increased length of stay and increased costs. And we found one study that said the average length of stay was two days longer in patients with a contaminated blood culture compared to patients with negative cultures. So in order to avoid such contaminants, skin antisepsis, appropriate skin antisepsis is recommended. And I'm curious to know if uh, everybody knows how to perform skin antisepsis prior to collection of blood for blood culture. Okay, how to avoid contamination. So this is from the CDC. First, perform diagnostic stewardship. This is what the clinician can do. Diagnostic stewardship. What you can do, the clinicians you should strive to obtain blood cultures for the right patient at the right setting at the right time. Does the patient necessitate blood culture testing? And uh, what timing is, is it? Is it has, where has it been? And everything at, at the same time. Proper skin antisepsis, like I will discuss with you. Even the blood culture bottle should be disinfected, the cap of the, uh, the bottle. Okay. Okay. See, blood culture collection site. They've observed that a peripheral site is preferred over a catheter drawn blood culture because it yields uh, less uh, contaminants. Hand hygiene with appropriate uh, donning of gloves. And they've observed that a phlebotomy and nursing teams who are trained and educated on the collection of blood culture is preferred over anybody. So this is from a screen grab from the CDC. Clinicians should strive to obtain blood cultures for the right patients in the right setting at the right time. Blood cultures can be both underused and overused. An example of underuse would be not obtaining blood cultures prior to starting antibiotics for a patient with suspected sepsis. Without a blood culture collected, before starting antibiotics, it can be more difficult to appropriately de-escalate antibiotic therapy, given that the causative organism is more likely to be unknown. Also, blood cultures can be underused if appropriate volume is less than recommended. So if for a paired blood culture, it would be 20 ml for adults. Uh, as this can decrease the sensitivity for pathogen detection. And the cultures can also be overused, for example, obtaining repeat cultures in a patient with fever for whom an alternative diagnosis other than bloodstream infection is much more likely. In patients with a very low pretest probability of bloodstream infection, a positive culture is more likely to represent contamination than infection. So I've had this happen before, that someone sent a blood culture in and they deal with positive growth, and then they came and asked me, how can there be a positive growth, the patient is fine. So I said, if the patient was fine, why did you send a blood culture in the first place? So it has to be appropriate for the patient. Does the patient seem septic to you? Is there a chance of bacteremia? And why should we waste uh, testing? Proper skin antisepsis I will discuss with you, and uh, blood culture bottle disinfection. Prior to inoculating it with blood, the top should be uh, dis disinfected with alcohol as well. Collection site, I've already told you, the peripheral venipuncture site is consistently associated with lower rates of blood culture contamination. Hand hygiene should be performed prior to collection. Phlebotomy and nursing teams and their education and proper technique should happen. So, generally guidelines, according to the American Society of Microbiologists, they recommend disinfection of the phlebotomy site with 2% alcoholic chlorhexidine or 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol followed by 2% chlorhexidine with at least 30 seconds allowed for drying. This is the contact time. We need this. If you don't wait, then the appropriately the, the anti sorry, the bacteria is not killed appropriately. Also, this should be happening in concentric circles from center to periphery. It shouldn't just be a one swipe and that's it, immediately you draw blood. Yeah, are going to Fail. Yes. So as far, uh, as far as I know, there have been training sessions conducted by Hamad and Dr. Maro for sampling, and they've told me that they have uh, done, multi done it multiple times and asked the nurses. They did not know how to perform it, and that they taught them. Uh, we, but we it has to be a regular thing. We have uh, the, the head of nursing, head of 
unit telling you where the blood circles are sent, make it mm. mandate the cholesterol. Yes, so sir. you have to do it whether you like it or not. Yes, sir. The last Saturday, actually, uh, uh, after consulting with we have conducted a uh, training session for nurses, or then even we have invited the head nurses to our lab so that they can uh, see the flow. Uh, and uh, we will continue doing it okay, uh, every Saturday this will go on. Okay. But I, I should say that you have to check the implementation of the chapter. Amber will do the round, but if you have to see that the staff is doing it rightly, or if you have to practice or any enforcement, you have to do it. Maybe dedicate the staff that already knows how to do it. Yes. Yes. Those were for manual, uh, the conventional blood culture was glass bottles. Now it's been replaced. Did it contaminate anything? And you said uh, it will take about five days. Uh, don't you think it's causing so much uh, time period for the uh, Five days for negative, negative, for the negative final report. If it's flagged positive in the first 24 hours, the final report should reach you in three days. The initial report will reach you at 24 hours, whether it's positive or negative. And the... the The bottle will stay in the machine. The right side of the graph. You see, all the arrows are connected. If it's negative first day, but it flags positive on the on the second day, it will still continue with the positive. If it flags positive on the third day, I will continue treating it. Huh? Yes, and the bottle, the question that you had, the new bottles for the machine but are plastic. Will use, uh, new bottles? Yes, there will be a new bottle in every subculture for every patient. For every oh, I'm sorry, what's your question? For every? For, for every patient, uh, you will use new bottles. Yes, yes, of course. No, no, never. We always use one bottle. Even with the glass bottles, it would be the same bottle for one patient and it would be never be used again. Five days. Five days. Yes. Any other question? I have a few concerns. Easy. You have mentioned that the MASH policy will be to send at least four minutes. Yes. Right? And you have quoted two references. Yes. One is CDC and the other one is Yes. Can you show me that retrospective study? Sure, sir. That's the reference I have given you. That? This retrospective study showed that less than three minutes showed the lowest possibility. Yes. Whereas eight to ten minutes volume had greatest need. Yes. Right? Let's say the sensitivity of eight to ten minutes of volume is approaches 90%. Yes. Okay. Okay. Although it has not been mentioned in the study, Mm -hmm. Let's say it approaches 90%. And in your CDC reference that you have shown me, mm -hmm. it, it suggests that at least two to three, uh, two to three vials of 20 mils. Mm -hmm. Right? So the average volume of blood culture comes to be seven mils to 10 ml. Mm -hmm. right? So why are you suggesting that the four mils of volume... This is the minimum the acceptable. Volume? Minimum acceptable we're saying at which we will reject if it's lower than that because three is the cutoff here, the lowest positivity rate. It's because there's poor compliance with the most uh, clinicians to send eight ml or 10 ml. 10, 20 was, if it was a paired blood culture, both 10 ml because that's the manufacturer recommendation of up to 10 ml, not even more than 10 ml, right? So of course I would accept seven to eight or even 10 ml, but I'm saying if you have a concern about the amount you can uh, remove from a patient, four is the cutoff. Four is the cutoff. Yes, for us. Because three, according to the study that I found, means three that we was. should send at least seven to ten minutes. Ideally. 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 Yes. Ideally. But even if you send four, I will accept it. And in 24 hours, we expect that you should report us gram negative reports. Gram negative reports. If, if, it's, if it's flag positive, yes. Positive. With gram negative, yes. So 
So if we send cultures to you, will we expecting that you will immediately report us a gram stain? Immediately, no. It has to so be within 24 hours. hours. No. If it's negative, you will get the initial report after 24 hours. Shouldn't we do gram stain on every blood culture? Sir, we are performing gram stain. If it's flag positive, why would I perform it on a negative? That's a waste of uh, resources. I'm saying that we should have a, we should have a protocol in place hmm. that every blood culture being sent to lab should be tested for gram stain. Because gram stain is immediately available that helps physicians to All right. escalate and... However, sir, microscopy has lower sensitivity compared to culture. Okay. I would need in that sample 10 to the power 4 microorganisms per ml to be able to see it on a microscope. Okay. However, only 10 organisms in the whole sample will still yield growth on culture. So if you are, if you are using this BACTEC medium Back alert, yes. onwards, should we expect that you will tell us cultures in 24 hours and then 48 hours? We will only be uh, able to tell you if it is positive. positive. Okay. Uh, within 24 hours, initial report will be generated if it, if okay. it is positive with ground stain. Yes. Okay. And if it is, it is negative, then the report will be negative. It's negative. The report is negative. Yes. But we will keep on incubating it. Yes. That means it's a tabulated representation of the cumulative uh, proportions of pathogenic organisms susceptible or resistant to particular antimicrobials within an institution over a period of time. So when should it be used? It's used to assess local susceptibility rates as an aid in selecting empirical antibiotic therapy and in monitoring resistance trends over time within an institute. So this is a, a basic representation of how to read an antibiogram. So across uh, in the rows, you will see the microorganisms labeled, and in the columns, A, B, C to, D, to G, these are the antibiotics. There's also a key on your right side, which tells you which uh, symbol represents which antibiotic. And percentage resistance, uh, uh, percentage R is equal to percentage resistance in the organism. IR is intrinsic resistance because certain organisms have the ability to have an innate resistance to any antibiotic. And NT is not tested. So I'm going to give uh, a declaimer first. Sir, it, the, it is there. Declaimer is, is <laughs> that you will prescribe the antibiotic accord if a appropriate culture code is available. Yes. This antibiogram is for empiric therapy. A, uh, antibiotic, a guide to start the antibiotic. Yes. When the culture is awaited. Yes, prior to sensitivity. Uh, all the time, every time, you should be giving antibiotic according to the culture sensitivity result. However, this is a guide for empiric therapy if and when you have to start it. So, this is, uh, there have been two uh, antibiograms published for Mukhtari Shev. The first was for uh, 2021. And it was very basic. We uh, grouped indoor and outdoor cases together and gave you a total representation. However, for 2022, uh, for the first six months, the data was divided into indoor cases, outdoor cases, and uh, some others that were not mentioned up, up there, like Salmonella typhi was mentioned separately. And then I divided it according to the specimens. So depending on which OPD you're running, what kind of specimen, what kind of infection you're suspecting, and what kind of specimen you're going to send to the lab, you can uh, curtail, you can uh, change the parenteral therapy based on the antibiogram. For example, for respiratory specimens, the uh, most often seen were Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. Then for blood and CVP line, Staph aureus was the most isolated, followed by E. coli. Then there's pus, pus swab, and tissue, urine. So this is how you can use the antibiogram specifically to see how many organisms were, uh, were isolated, what was the resistance pattern. In summary, the number of samples we received over there 2021, 2022 the second uh, set still has to be published. So uh, it was 1,675 number of samples received. Of those, approximately 251 were positive cultures. And most frequent pathogen was E. coli. The percentage of MRSA was 50% of all staphylococci and the percentage of the MDR gram-negative rods was 27% on average. So you can use this data to compare it with national data because the National Institute of Health, NIH, it conducts a AMR surveillance, which is antimicrobial resistance surveillance program. And unfortunately, they haven't really followed up since 2000 and, uh, 2018. So for our uh, data, we can see that, uh, for example, for MRSA, 50% was the uh, positive MRSA rate in 2021. And in the first half of 2022, we've had 65% MRSAs. 
AMR uh, for Pakistan, all over Pakistan in 2017, showed that there was a load of 35 to 40 percent MRSA all over Pakistan. And 2018, it was 68 percent. So we are still behind the number in 2018. There is a severe deficiency of data all over Pakistan. We don't know how it stands in 2022 for all over Pakistan. But if it was this bad in 2018, we can only imagine. With aseptic proper techniques, yes, so it's coming from flora. So like, um, huh. uh, I, I say for urine culture, as I just mm. tell you how it mm. is collected yeah. in the ward. Yeah. If you will collect a, uh, a sample from a bag which is lying on the floor, mm. or, uh, uh, it will add few yeah. bacteria, hospital required bacteria mm. to the culture. And mm. Those will be MRSA. Yes. Next. Uh, biggest challenge these days is probably those MRSC coming from the community. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, prescribing uh, practices yeah. of uh, practitioners across, across the hospitals, yes. Uh, so then we can also perform a comparison with other hospitals. So there's a website called parn.org where uh, different hospitals share their antibiograms. Unfortunately, they have not updated since 2020. So what we found uh, when I saw uh, Al Khan University's 2020 antibiogram, their MRSA load was 98.7%. For Shakat Khanam, it stands at 50%. And for Jinnah, it's uh, 56% for 2020. So this is how we can compare our own with the other hospitals uh, within Punjab and within Sindh. I hope you will put the mesh on the map as well. I hope so, so inshallah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, this will be the first that one. Yes, sir. Okay, so, uh, so far we only have two published antibiograms, the third one, inshallah, I will start work on. Uh, when we have enough data collected, enough antibiograms over a period of time, we can make a trend any kind of trend. For example, this is a trend I made for E. coli, which is the most frequently encountered anti, uh, micro, uh, microbe in both years. So you can see that the light colored bar it represents 2021, and uh, January to June, the first six months 2022, are the dark colored bar. You can plot the antibiotics across this line and see whether there was a fall in resistance or an increase in resistance within a year. So as you can see, most of the resistance uh, percentages fell, except in the case of ciprofloxacin, cortamoxazole, and doxycycline. So somewhere, we were doing performing good antimicrobial stewardship. Something is going right that there is a trend towards uh, a decrease in resistance against most antibiotics. Second half, of course, is still to be seen, the second part of uh, 2022. But this is just an example of how we can plot a trend with more data collected in the past and view how we are changing our practices. So, Amber, I would suggest you, uh, whenever you publish a new exercise, come to the background. Come to the? OK. okay. 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 All right. And Dr. Sham, your question was about the most frequent encounter E. coli and where Augmentin stands. Augmentin is at 77% resistance right now. It's fallen from 88%. It's getting better. However, there was still, I would say, carbapenems are still the better suggestion for ESPL. ESBL itself is one mechanism of resistance. There are furthermore mechanisms of resistance as well that can be employed to give resistance to augmentin. That was your question at the start. Okay. So th again, similarly, for example, there's a trend for pseudomonas, which is going to be one of the most tricky, the, the problematic uh, microbes for our institute right now. Because for imipenem and miropenem, it, there is a rise in resistance within just the first half of one year. And we haven't even plotted the second half. 
And uh, in this case, uh, piperacin and tazobactam is still holding strong at 45% resistance. Ceftazidime has fallen, so that could be a better option. But uh, more use of carapenems is leading uh, to an increase in carapenem resistant uh, pseudomonas and MD organism, and even a rise in colistin resistance. So this is the one to watch out for. Yes, in the first half of 2022. It's more than 20%. Yes. So second half is still to be published. From July to December, I'm going to start working on it. Okay. So this is imipenem, rapenem, ciprofloxacin, gentacin, and... Amikacin, amikacin. CTs. Colistin. Also rising. Even there are colistin resistance. That we do check levofloxacin. I did not include it here. It can have a different one. Especially for people like considering that uh, ciprofloxacin are so high. Yeah. 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 No, well, we. Uh, first. We put in levofloxacin in All right. I will take your suggestion on hand. Because mine is very good to go to antibiotics. Is levofloxacin. All right. I will. I will take your suggestion and I will include it in chat. It is just for all the equalizing counters so far. Some may ESPL nahi hai, sir. It's been mentioned nahi hai, sir. Even in the report may be used to it. So then at the same time, like we were plotting a trend for our microbes, we can also plot a trend for antibiotics. Just to look at how efficacious that uh, uh, antibiotic is overall. So you can see this is for piperacin and tazobactam across multiple uh, microbes. And so far, it's been very effective against Acinetobacter bomini and also effective against E. coli. So, uh, only Pseudomonas is the problem drug, uh, the problem microbe here. Acinetobacter is sensitive to be precedent? Sir, 57, now it's zero, sir, in 2022. Because so far, we have not encountered that many. But zero percent resistance, because so far, I think, uh, 2022 ke start, I didn't see any of So second half still has to be plotted, so it has to be published by me. Do you suggest us uh, that we should use this repressor uh, for acetobacter? I would suggest you wait for the culture sensitivity report. Take care. That's what we have. Yeah. Yeah. And basically, yeah. Resistance. Yeah. Resistance. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is just basing it off of two antibiograms so far. If you have only two, one is sensitive and one is resistant, then it's 50% of flat. So, anyway. So, in conclusion, the data that is presented in the antibiogram has great significance when making a decision on empiric therapy. And the data spanning a number of antibiograms can be used to plot trends in the antimicrobial susceptibility and to observe any change in pattern in the given institute. So if you take early action in regard to antimicrobial stewardship, it will have a significant impact on patient safety, microbial resistance, as well as overall cost. So that's it.